Hello, I'm Lauren McCafferty, and I'm an Emergency Ultrasound Fellow at University Hospitals Cleveland Medical Center. I'll be discussing a case in which transcutaneous point-of-care ultrasound was used to diagnose a peritonsillar abscess with parapharyngeal extension in the emergency department. The case. So this was a 26-year-old, otherwise healthy male who presented for five days of increasing sore throat. He had been seen in the emergency department about 36 hours prior to this, was diagnosed with strep throat, and discharged home on oral antibiotics. In spite of this, he developed worsening of dynophagia and dysphagia and was unable to tolerate anything orally as a result. He also reported subjective fever, chills, and predominantly left-sided neck pain that developed since his previous visit. His review of systems was otherwise negative, including any respiratory symptoms. He denied any recent trauma or other illnesses, and there was nothing else significant in his history to date. On exam, he had normal vitals. He was uncomfortable but non-toxic appearing and in no distress. He did have a muffled voice, mild dysphonia, and mild trismus when you asked him to open his mouth. His oropharyngeal exam revealed left tonsillar swelling, with exudates. His uvula was midline. He also had left anterior cervical lymphadenopathy and difficulty extending his neck. No signs of airway compromise. He had no respiratory distress and he was controlling his secretions without any difficulty. At this point, point of care ultrasound using a transcutaneous submandibular approach was performed. I'll briefly go over the technique here. So use a high frequency linear probe or the curvilinear probe, whichever works better, and place it just below and parallel to the mandible with a probe marker pointing toward the patient's ear. The probe itself is directed superiorly and slightly posteriorly. And the view you're going to get looks something like this. It's essentially upside down. Um, so structures at the top of the screen are inferior on the patient and structures at the bottom of your screen are more superior on the patient. So the patient's tongue here is on the right side of the screen, and then the 2.2 centimeters um, that's concerning for abscess. So compare this to his unaffected side, where you can see a normal tonsil. Uh, this appears as a triangular or oval-shaped structure with uh, low-level echogenic texture. Um, there's no obvious fluid collection around it, um, so this is a normal appearance. So going back to uh, the affected side, you see that... Um, there is no color flow with color Doppler. Um, based on the exam and ultrasound findings, we were able to confidently or more confidently diagnose a left peritonsillar abscess. So just some general points. When you're doing this scan, you want to fan through the entire area to ensure that you aren't missing anything, um, as abscesses don't always show up in the same place. It just depends on where in the peritonsillar space this develops. You also want to assess for surrounding vasculature, especially the carotid, so that you know where this is in relation to the abscess. This is especially important when you, when you go to drain it, just so you know how close it actually is. And here, um, the red arrow indicates um, the carotid artery uh, for this patient, which is just posterior and lateral, and lateral to his abscess. Because of the patient's dysphonia and neck pain, I then move the probe slightly more caudally and anteriorly to the hypopharynx. So here I have the probe just left of midline, kind of angled superiorly, though I did fan throughout this entire region, just kind of looking for any obvious abnormalities. I did place the ultrasound probe in the more conventional orientation for this evaluation um, with a probe marker pointing toward the patient right, um, just because this made more sense from an anatomical perspective. So you can see here that the patient's anterior midline is at the top left of the screen. The airway is just deep to that. And then you can see the thyroid cartilage coming kind of posterior laterally off of that. So at the posterior lateral aspect of the thyroid cartilage, you can see that there is a poorly defined hypoechoic area that was concerning for a possible extension of his PTA into this region. So compare it to the unaffected side and you can see that the anatomy is just more clearly defined. So based on the exam and ultrasound findings um, with concerns for deeper extension, a CT neck was obtained to evaluate for this. Um, so CT showed um, findings that were consistent with ultrasound, a confirmed a left peritonsillar abscess that measured two centimeters, 
and then a nonspecific fluid collection, likely phlegmon, was seen in the left peripharyngeal space. There was also a small amount of fluid in the retropharyngeal region as well. So continuing with the patient's ED course, uh, prior to actually him going to CT, he received IV fluids, toradol, dexamethasone, and a dose of unison um, for his peritonsillar abscess. Um, so then after CT, um, his PTA was drained at bedside and approximately three cc's of purulent material were aspirated. Um, we actually um, performed a point of care ultrasound after this, um, not shown here, but it confirmed um, resolution of the abscess. So ENT was consulted um, given his deeper extension, and they opted for conservative management of, of this. Um, so we decided to admit the patient to the um, emergency department's clinical decision unit, where he was monitored overnight, received more steroids and antibiotics. His symptoms improved. Um, his cultures came back growing group A strep, and he was discharged the following day on steroids and antibiotics. Now I'm going to talk a little about deep neck space infections, particularly peritonsillar abscess and the role of ultrasound. So deep neck space infections are often rapid onset and potentially life-threatening if not promptly recognized and treated appropriately. The most common of these is by far peritonsillar abscesses, much more so than peripharyngeal or retropharyngeal abscesses. So as the name implies, it's an abscess or fluid collection in the peritonsillar space. These tend to occur more, most often in older children and young adults, are often associated with tonsillitis, and a potential complication of PTA could be airway compromised from the swelling of the PTA itself, as well as spread to surrounding structures in deeper spaces of the neck. Spread to these spaces also puts the patient at risk for spread into the mediastinum via the retropharyngeal space as they have a direct communication, um, also known as the danger space. It can also spread systemically via the major vasculature that's in this area as well. So while sometimes the patient's presentation is clear, oftentimes it can be very subtle in mimicking uh, bit more benign processes. This poses a diagnostic challenge, which isn't great considering that this is such a life-threatening, um, potentially life-threatening process. Traditionally, peritonsillar abscess is diagnosed by physical exam and confirmed with blind aspiration. Unfortunately, physical exam alone has demonstrated poor reliability with a sensitivity of 78% and a specificity of 50%. CT is often utilized, especially nowadays, but is also not without its own risk. It requires radiation exposure, contrast, which usually means the patient has to have labs, and generally takes longer to obtain. While CT is highly sensitive with a sensitivity of approximately 100%, its specificity is only 75%, so it's not a perfect test. Point of care ultrasound is a under, is an underutilized yet valuable tool for diagnosing peritonsillar abscess. It's readily available, you can do it at the bedside, and studies have shown a fairly high sensitivity and specificity with fewer risks. There are two general approaches, a transoral and a transcutaneous approach. The transoral approach is the more commonly employed and better studied approach. It involves placing the endocavitary probe into the patient's mouth directly over the affected area. It's demonstrated sensitivity of 90% and its use has correlated with less CT utilization, less ENT consultation, and achieves better aspiration of purulent material when compared to a landmark approach for suspected PTA. Some downsides to this approach include the following. So the endocavitary approach is less readily available than other probes. So sometimes it just might not even be possible to do and you have to do the transcutaneous approach. Also, this is a somewhat invasive approach. It's more uncomfortable for the patient and is especially difficult in those with trismus. Furthermore, when you're draining these and you're using ultrasound um, to directly guide it, it's not the easiest to fit the probe and the needle and part of your hand inside the patient's mouth, especially when they do have trismus. The transcutaneous approach, as employed in this case, is far less common but has promising utility based on small studies and some case reports. As previously described, use the linear or curvilinear probe and place it in the submandibular region, pointing posteriorly and superiorly. While far less studied, the sensitivity and specificity of this approach are reported to be 80% and 93% respectively, with specificity being higher than that of transoral. The diagnostic accuracy even approaches 100% in cases of severe trismus that preclude a transoral approach.
So this approach has the advantage of being less invasive and better tolerated by patients. It's also not affected at all by trismus. Additionally, drainage may be easier as only the needle has to enter the patient's oral cavity. And you can still perform dynamic ultrasound guided drainage while keeping the probe externally entering the needle into the um, peritonsillar space intraorally, and you can visualize the needle coming into view from the side. Regardless of approach, ultrasound in general has the benefit of being readily available at the bedside, easy to use, and repeatable. You can potentially save the patient from CT as well as unnecessary IND. Ultrasound can also be of use with either approach when draining the PTA, whether by static or dynamic guidance, and it's also useful post-drainage to ensure that the fluid was successfully aspirated. Of note, the utility of transcutaneous ultrasound for parapharyngeal and retropharyngeal infections remains relatively unclear, as the evidence for these deeper infections is sparse. In summary, a prompt diagnosis of PTA and deeper neck space infections is critical. This case demonstrates how point-of-care ultrasound, specifically using a transcutaneous approach, has promising utility. This approach is less invasive, readily available, and can provide a prompt diagnosis within minutes. You should consider this technique in patients in which you suspect PTA and potentially deeper space infections, as it can expedite management and ultimately improve patient care. Thank you for listening.